Previously, we looked at the first episode of the Goosebumps TV show, a very solid adaptation of The Haunted Mask that hired a very talented creative staff and utilized the visual medium to get the most unsettling imagery out of R.L. Stein's prose. However, first episodes are rarely reflective of what groove a show will eventually fall into. In many cases, a show will learn from the mistakes of its first episode, or first couple of episodes, or first couple of seasons, and work to improve itself. Goosebumps the TV show didn't go for that model. The goal seems to more likely have been to knock the first episode out of the park, really get its hooks into you before settling into a far less polished main series. So today we're going to the middle of season one, when the show has settled into what it was going to be for the long run. Let's talk about Stay Out of the Basement. Saturday on Fox Kids, Stay Out of the Basement. Why are leaves growing out of your head? Because we're serving up a spectacular all-new one-hour Goosebumps special. <laughs> so eat your veggies before they eat you. Plant that is part animal. Catch a bonus special all-new one-hour Goosebumps, Saturday on Fox Kids. Stay Out of the Basement Part 1 and 2 aired back-to-back -back on January 26, 1996. It was directed by William Fruitt. Last time, we talked about Timothy Bond's extensive experience with television horror, but Fruitt's background is in film horror, making several Canadian horror movies in the 70s and 80s before becoming a television director. Conversely, the episode's credited writer, Sean Kelly, has virtually no horror experience to his name besides one single episode of Dracula the series. Most of his main credits are in children's PBS programming like Shining Time Station and The Magic School Bus. Though by contrast, he was also one of the founding editors of the English language heavy metal magazine. This would be the only Goosebumps story he would write for. However, multiple wikis list Billy Brown and Dan Angel as uncredited co-writers. I haven't been able to independently confirm this, but they're worth bringing up as they were the show's executive story editors, basically the creative showrunners. They're an inseparable writing duo to this day, their first major credit being the John Carpenter and Toby Hooper's co-directed TV movie Body Bags. Goosebumps was their first regular series, and they would continue to work with R.L. Stein for his various television projects over the years, producing and writing for The Haunting Hour and Monsterville. I don't know if they secretly rewrote this two-parter or not, but we'll be seeing a lot of these two this month, and by all accounts they were great to work with. It was a totally positive experience all the way through. It was fantastic coming to work every day and hanging out with guys like Billy Brown and Dan Angel. That's not to say it wasn't stressful and there wasn't a lot of pressure, but it was a lot of fun. I would do it again in a second. Before we get into the episode proper, we've got to talk about that opening. Just like Tim Jacobus' stunning cover art did for the Goosebumps books, Jack Lenz's iconic theme music really sets the tone for the show, being both moody and blood pumping at the same time. If the Goosebumps TV show has any legacy, it's this piece of music. The opening itself is properly moody as well. We see R.L. Stein, but as a mysterious and threatening man in black, his writing spreading and corrupting the city beneath him. The dog's eyes start to glow. The woman, um, loses volume in her hair. Okay, I'm, I'm not sure what that one's about. Viewers beware, you're out of shampoo, goosebumps. But that's enough context. What of the episode itself? Well, first off, I'm not sure why this had to be a two-parter. Stay Out of the Basement is a very simple story. One location, a house with a mad scientist laboratory in the basement. Only three major characters of note, Margaret, Casey, and their off-putting mad scientist father, Dr. Brewer. You're not a mad scientist, are you, Dad? No, I'm an angry scientist. The episode doesn't need much in the way of special effects or production values. Just a couple of small puppet vines, a bunch of plastic ferns from a furniture store, and some ooze here and there. And the story is dead simple. Dad starts acting strange and threatening, the kids get worried, start poking around, discover all the mad scientists that's been going on in the basement, and they fight the terror. 
The show has compressed far more complicated plots into 22 minutes, and I'm not sure why they felt it was necessary to extend this one. You could take advantage of the extended runtime to build a moody atmosphere and really marinate in it, but doing so means spending more time with the characters, and that touches on the episode's two big problems. The dialogue and the child acting. I get no pleasure in saying that the child acting is bad. Very, very few child actors are more than just okay, because they're inexperienced in both acting and life, and they've got other things going on like school and friends and probably show business parents, and most of them don't go on to have adult acting careers for various reasons. But it really feels like Becky Lantos, who played Margaret, and Blake McGarth, who played Casey, were given no acting directions whatsoever. Here's a scene that exemplifies that perfectly, with Margaret sneaking into Casey's room while he's asleep. What are you doing? Shh. I'm scared, Casey. I saw something last night. Shush. You need to be quiet. I saw something very weird, and we don't want to alert Dad. We must be very quiet. It's like this through the entire 44 minutes. Flat dialogue spoken a little too loudly for a piece of horror. No real attempt at stage whispering or whimpering in fear or even much screaming. Just no character in the performances at all. But the bigger problem is the writing. The script is bad. Consider this. You need your characters to get plot information from a message left on the phone's answering machine. The characters can't answer the phone themselves. How do you let the answering machine take the call without the kids answering it? Don't answer it! Why not? I don't know. Oh, brilliant! A mastercraft of screenwriting! The worst scene, however, is the opening one, with Margaret and her mother as the latter is packing up for a trip. We get a lot of exposition as to who the characters are, how Dad is already behaving weirdly, about where Mom is going and why, and how Margaret feels about all of this. It's typical telling and not showing, which isn't always a bad thing despite what your creative writing teacher might have told you, but it's the worst kind of tell-don't show, when both the characters already know this information and have to keep acknowledging that they all know this information. I wish you weren't going. So do I. But your Aunt Eleanor's sick, honey. She needs me. I know, but... I'll be back as soon as I can. I know, it's just that... What does he do down there anyway? He's a botanist. He studies plants. I know that. He wants to prove to the university that they made a mistake when they let him go. You know, it's never really fun to be fired. I know all that. Did I mention that Sean Kelly never wrote another episode of Goosebumps? In terms of visuals, the show has mostly dropped the deep blacks and shadows of the haunted mask for that blue to represent the dark lighting scheme that is not ineffective, and I know it's a lot easier to film than actual darkness, but it does feel like a step down. And then there's the basement laboratory, bathed in green, appropriate, and packed with some easily sourced plastic plant life. I know it was paced like this in the book as well, but it feels like we see the basement way too early, just a few minutes into part one. You could have built up some proper suspense by the mystery of it all. What's in the basement? But they show their hand way too early. So with suspense in this episode hobbled, the main source of horror in this piece comes from the TVPG body horror of Dr. Brewer as he begins to exhibit strange behaviors and physical changes. It's a lot of small, incremental things that make this episode a step down from both its source material and the example set by the Haunted Mask episode. The big problem is the script. The acting is bad, but that's inevitable, and the production values are a downgrade, but serviceable. But the script, with its horrible dialogue, lack of suspenseful pacing, plot contrivances, and inability to justify itself as a two-parter, that's what kills it. And so that's our example of what Goosebumps the TV show is like normally. Not as a special event, not as a pilot, but as a normal part of regular television. But there's plenty more to explore here. For example, what happens when this show takes a Goosebumps book and adds a totally original second part to it. Next time, we'll look at Monster Blood, 
and more monster blood. <laughs>